Hello everyone, welcome to Unit 4, Lesson 2 in our vertebrates section called Amphibians. Let's go ahead and get started. Amphibians, or Class Amphibia. Now remember, for our organizational purposes, we are still in Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Subphylum Vertebrata. Okay, All of our animals that we're talking about in this unit follow along the same up to the subphylum classifications. Where we differ is in our class. So this particular class is amphibia. Okay, And this is the first time we actually see animals living on land. So we see our land invasion for the very first time. Now this only happens during the adult stage of their life cycle. Okay, They must return to the water to reproduce. They are not adapted for a long-term land only living. They cannot reproduce on land. They must go back to the water to fertilize, to lay their eggs and to fertilize those eggs. Those eggs are hatched. Um, and the reason for that is that the eggs do not have a protective covering from either predators or from the sun. So therefore they must seek shelter and support in water. Okay. So the eggs hatch in the water. They live in the water as young, uh, the most classic example would that be a frog and a tadpole. Okay, so that's they are hatched, they go into the water still, they breathe water, or, or they, they extract oxygen from the water, I should say. They develop over time into an adult frog, which can then live for time on land. Okay, their skin has a mucus covering. It is not what we would consider a true land skin. All right, they have a specific portions of their body will excrete this mucus throughout their entire day and throughout their entire adult life to keep the skin moist. And there's a particular reason why they need that mucus covering to survive. They do not have a thick layer of keratin in our, like our skin does. So we need to have this mucus layer to help us extract oxygen from the air because over 50% of an amphibian's respiratory function, meaning it gets 50% of the oxygen it needs to survive from the air going through the skin. All right, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. There are four main types of amphibians. We have frogs, which you can see over here, very brightly colored ones. Now typically, as is any animal, the brightly colored ones are typically ones you want to stay with because they will typically be poisonous. The difference again between poison and venom is venom must be injected into the bloodstream, uh, typically uh, used with a fang, and poison is normally absorbed through the skin. So if you were to touch this, the poison would get through the pores in your skin and that way get into the bloodstream and that's how you would get infected with it. Now, another way to get poisoned is to ingest it. So if you were to, I guess, lick the frog, then you would ingest the poison. Although I highly recommend you not doing that. Our next group is the toads. This is this guy over here. Very similar to frogs, slightly different in body shape and eye shape. You can see the eyes in a typical frog are very round whereas the eyes are round, but the eyelids and stuff around them typically on a toad will be more triangular shape. Now that's a generality. It's not in every case. There is an exception, uh, as is everything in science. But generally speaking, um, that's one of the differences. Also, typically your toads are a little bit more stout. So they're a little bit uh, fatter than their frog cousins. All right. And then we have the newt. And that is this little guy right down here. And finally, the salamander. All right, so those are our four main types of amphibians, frogs, toads, newts, and salamanders. They are a very important species. It's what we like to call an indicator species. Their presence, absence, or abundance reflects a specific environmental condition. They can signal environmental changes like pollution. For example, look at these frogs, okay? These frogs should be this bright green color, but they're not. They're bright green around the head, but then their bodies are this dark brown, nasty looking bit. And that is an indication of pollution in this particular water source. Okay, So this is them being an indicator species in action. Now, 
This is a good indicator species as far as frogs go because they reproduce so quickly. So we can see changes that rapidly happen in their offspring. So this is only a couple of generations in to the actual pollution taking hold in this particular ecosystem. Another benefit is that the eggs are macroscopic. Okay, and macroscopic means we can see them with our naked eye. We don't have to use a microscope. So they are macroscopic. If amphibian eggs are harmed or damaged, this typically will indicate a problem for the entire ecosystem. And it doesn't always have to just happen with eggs. As you can see in this example, these are um, subadults or adults in the frogs. Okay, so it's not always just eggs and it's not always just juveniles that will show the problem. Now the big star here, do you want to make sure you know about amphibians being indicator species is that ultimately it gives us a very quick assessment of the overall health of that ecosystem. And that should go away. Okay, so the overall health of that ecosystem. Again, make sure you know this. I bet you you know why you need to know that. Make sure you star that. That is the key component to us talking about an indicator species. Now this is their typical life cycle. On the surface, or on first glance, this may look like what you would consider a complete metamorphosis based off of our last unit. And that would be wrong. So complete metamorphosis, or metamorphosis in and of itself, only talks about the arthropods. Okay, And complete metamorphosis are in organisms like the caterpillars that you guys are still working with. So please, do not, do not, no bad, okay? Do not associate amphibians with complete metamorphosis. Their eggs are actually called spawn, so we have frog spawn, and then we go through the tadpole stages, and the tadpoles actually do uh, filter water through their gills. They actually do have gills, okay? And as they develop into young adults, um, into this 10-week-old, around this guy, he starts losing his gills, and they actually will absorb into the body and develop into lungs. And then we end up with an adult frog. Now an adult frog gets 50% of its oxygen from absorbing air through its skin. Okay? Another large portion of air actually comes in its mouth. So they'll actually open up their mouth and they'll be able to, because it's very moist in there, uh, their bodies are adapted to extract air through that moisture and into its body. Now the lungs that these guys do have only really come into play if they're moving a lot. So if they, if they can't get enough oxygen out of the air from their skin or their mouth, then the lungs go into action. Okay, so it's very different than us. In our case, we breathe through our lungs and our lungs handle all of the oxygen needs. Now we, don't, we do get a small portion of oxygen through the skin, but amphibians actually get a little more than 50% of their air just through their skin. So here's some advancements. Here's some of that gas exchange. So air coming into the system through the skin. So this is that epidermal layer. And then carbon dioxide exhales through it. Okay. And then this is its underdeveloped lung. And their body covering is covered in mucus again. And the reason it's covered in mucus is that moisture allows... Uh, air to get to that body a little bit easier, a little bit less energy, and that moisture allows oxygen to get passed through. Now remember, oxygen gets extracted from water during these guys' juvenile stage while they're living in the water. So it's not too far of a stretch to realize that they extract the oxygen from the outside air. All right, And they do have a logical thinking brain. Not anywhere as close to the capacity of a human, but it is a thinking brain, okay? And we'll talk more about brains and hearts with our amphibians in class. In our last uh, couple of slides, we are going to talk about our next Geek of the Week, one of my personal favorites, Jacques Cousteau. And Jacques Cousteau was a very famous documentary film artist, uh, was born in France, uh, died in France, so that's cool. Uh, produced over 115 documentary films, and they were all focused on marine life. Now, he did more than just documentary filmmaking. He was like the 70s version of the crocodile hunter, okay? Uh, you guys are probably familiar with 
uh, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, who unfortunately passed away due to a, an erroneous attempt to save his life from a stingray stinger. Now, some of his big accomplishments were for those of us who love scuba diving, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, he pioneered some of the technologies for scuba that we use. Up until and through World War II, we had these really big dive bells where the guy had the big brass helmet and a big, wow, I'm a terrible artist, aren't I? And now I look like a gingerbread man cookie. Anyway, so that's a scuba diver back uh, around the World War II era. And he really, uh, Jacques Cousteau really pioneered making that more of a consumer, non-military type apparatus. And that's what we get to enjoy today. Uh, he also personally intervened uh, to restrict international whaling. Big lover of whales. He led the campaign to prevent French nuclear waste dumping in the Mediterranean Sea. Makes sense. He's a Frenchman, so he wants to protect his area. He helped engineered uh, underwater base camps. We do actually have uh, full-time laboratories under the water where aquanauts, people who go and study and live underwater, uh, up to two to three weeks at a time. So similar to an astronaut going to the International Space Station, uh, they'll actually go underneath the water and live for roughly a week to two weeks. And they actually have one of these over in Key West. Uh, if you ask me in class, I will pull up a picture of it because I don't have it in this slideshow. Uh, but it looks like a, it's kind of like a yellow submarine, just permanently under the water. So it's pretty cool. Uh, he also did countless books and TV shows and lecture, all to bring awareness of the beauty of uh, marine life and how delicate a balance our ocean is and how human beings messing with that natural balance can lead to horrendous effects. And unfortunately, those cries for help, that attention that he brought did not really accomplish its goal because we are still dumping stuff into our oceans. We're still vastly overfishing our species of fish that are in there. We're almost done killing all of the sharks that are in the ocean. Give us about 10 more years and they'll be gone. And our whales, our whales have a fighting chance because they're quote unquote cute and they have not been demonized by media. So people tend to care about whales more so than they do sharks, even though you can argue that sharks play a more vital role to the ocean's overall ecosystem than whales do. All right. Now, your video secret number for this particular one is going to be 42. Video secret number is 42. All right. I think this is the last slide, and it is. So thank you all very much for another version of our video lecture series. I'll see you in class.